All right, Sage, do you think we should get started? I think you're muted. Oh, let's see. Yeah, sorry. So you can hear me now. Oh, yep. We're good. All right. Um, let's see. Let's... Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Adam has a patch that changes the hashing behavior for several different data types. Um, this is great. Looks like we were, um, oh my gosh, we were using a totally weird hash there, weren't we? Thanks. Okay. Yep. So that's good. Um, managed to track down why a user was seeing very high CPU utilization. Um, it turns out it was just hash collisions. So that's great. I um, need to review and test that. I'll probably get backported once it's tested and in. Um, looks like there's a second one also. More hash collisions. This one is with uh, the GH object hash. Hmm. This one I think we need to be careful with because it's adding some additional hashing on the string, and the hash field of the H object should already be a hash of the string. So if that's colliding, then there's something. Maybe we need a stronger hash there, and that's actually the issue. Um, okay, let's see. There's a uh, Cephuse change that Patrick's reviewing. Um, turns out that our Luminous builds weren't properly enabling the fast CRC stuff, um, and I think a few other things. So that's been fixed. For this, I'll track that down. Kifu, I think, reviewed it. So it looks good. That's going to get merged. That'll go to the next one. And that on that uh on that topic it seems like we every like six months end up finding out that something's broken with the crc because yeah. of crazy rocks db things can we can we get them or can we fix that upstream so that it just stops breaking i think it's i don't think it was their fault i think it was our oh really okay but i'm not i'm not actually sure maybe it, 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 the last time i looked at any of this stuff it just it was like super fragile yeah, I mean, probably what we really need is like a, a test that verifies that the the fast version is compiled in, and that's kind of hard <laughs> to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. And six, it works in master, and then this should fix in Luminous, so yeah. right now at least we're okay. Um, let's see, there's uh, an improvement on the OSD for the batch listing. Um, that merged, and the LMDB experiment closed that out, that, that old pull request. So that's all good. Um, Adam's patch to improve assert efficiency is added to testing. That should be an easy win. Um, Let's see, it looks like there's, I haven't noticed this one, there's a async messenger pull request that reduces, reduces lock intention. That all sounds good. Oh, it put, does the put outside of lock? That sounds great. Yeah, that looks like a no brainer. Although, I bet. I could probably improve that a bit. Um, okay. And um, let's see, the discard, the inline discard got merged into master a bit ago, finally. And then there's a, an additional one that does periodic discard, kind of like FS trim. Um, that's undergoing review. Um, let's see, there's a work in progress from Radislav that um, Improves the efficiency of op tracker. Sounds good. I don't remember what which one this one was. This is the one getting rid of the read write mutex for this off. Hello, uh, could you repeat please? I had to uh, restart my browser. 
No problem. I'm looking at the um, the optimized op tracker branch that you uh, have. Is this the one uh, that gets rid of I, the read, write, and text and uh, yep. things? I removed uh, last week. I removed the DNM. Most uh, painful things uh, are resolved. I need to make some uh, cleanups, especially uh, I want to uh, combine tiny tiny vector with P2T to form chart charting vector with all that would take uh, care also for uh, proper alignment. Okay. It also looks like it needs a, a rebase and a bunch of stuff squashed. But um, yeah, if you, why don't you clean that up and then we can review and test it. Well, not next sure. week, when we get back. We'll do. Awesome. Okay. That sounds great. Um, oh, this Ostream thing isn't merged yet. No, uh, Kifu was saying that we had failures due to 2701 and 2662. Yeah, I, was gonna ask about that. Get, I think it needs to get retest. I think those are other things that were already fixed. Let's just retest it. I yeah. retracted this needs QA. So it's probably fine. Um, that local read thing from easy backend, small optimization didn't work. Um, I think haven't really looked at that yet, but it's kind of a low priority thing, so not too worried about it. Um, IO throttler for DM clock is still, oh, what's the, I'm not sure what are we waiting, are they waiting for us? I think this, the last thing I saw was this one guy was waiting for info from them, I think, but I don't know if we're, uh, all right. Okay. Um, and I guess that's mostly it. Some other stuff here. All this other stuff is pretty old. Um, okay. That's it for pull requests. Um, all right, so Mark has a whole bunch to talk about auto-tuning. Let's <laughs> save that for the end really quick. I wanted to bring up mutexes really quick. Um, we had that thread earlier. Uh, earlier this week on the list um, to switch to um, to switch to the standard library normal standard mutex stuff. Um, I think I think probably the path here is to um, uh, either just update Adam's implementation. Or if Jesse wants to, I don't know what Jesse, Jesse seems like he was working on his own one, but it, I don't know how it's going to be any different. Um, and set up a Seth mutex that aliases to one, either that or standard mutex, and then just start updating all the uppercase mutex users to use Seth mutex instead. Um, there are going to be a couple that are going to be annoying because they use, uh, like they use the asserts. So a couple of locks will be harder to convert. Um, but, uh, and then we can make it so that uh, there's a CMake option so that we'll use the standard mutex or, or CMake option to enable the locked up one. And then we can make the vstart do CMake line, do that by default so that vstart clusters by default get the um, locked up turned on. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I don't know if there's a lot to talk about there. Bredislav was saying this morning that he was looking at um, a lighting mutexes, which is some thing I'd never yeah. heard of on uh, internal processes. Uh, basically, uh, GDPC offers, uh, offers you several kinds of mutexes. Some of them are non-POSIX, of course, they are properly marked, but you can still have uh, get access to it. Uh, the things like adaptive mutex, and especially interesting one is uh, aligning mutex. Uh, the aligning mutex uh, <clears throat> is built on top of the Intel's uh, transactional, uh, transactional uh, synchronization extension. Trans trans sorry, transactional memory extension, TSX. Uh, I, the idea is to avoid, if there is no, if you have two threads accessing uh, the same 
uh, the same critical section. And if uh, they are, if the memory operations they are doing are not colliding, for instance, there is no uh, write uh, to the same memory location from uh, both of them, then a processor can can alight uh, exposing the value, uh, the new value of uh, log to memory subsystem, to uh, to caches. Everything could be could be kept entirely private to the core, which means uh, not only uh, aligning the calls to futex, uh, aligning the syscall, the futex syscalls, it also means even aligning the cache line bounds that is holding the atomic lock uh, behind standard mutex, behind futex. Uh, there are some report, reports uh, claiming huge benefits uh, from switching to aligning mutexes. Uh, I was talking this night, uh, yesterday with, uh, with them. Uh, I enforced, I had my GLPC and uh, CFOSD to use it. Per confirms, I've, uh, I've truly am using it and I'm getting 10% uh, slowdown from, the, from that, unfortunately. <laughs> and I guess the reason is that, <laughs> yeah, it, the reason is that we have colli colliding rights to the same cache lines. This means that uh, the tra memory transaction needs to be aborted and then CPU fallbacks to, uh, to usual uh, atomic operation, uh, to usual futex, which also can mean uh, syscall. I guess, I guess my main question is whether this is something that we can fit into a, um, a standard mutex implementation. That's so if we do, if we go on, okay. It depends. It depends because uh, <laughs> crazy complexity and its consequences. Uh, the TSX uh, extension popped up uh, in Haswell. However, a uh, hardware bug was discovered. Intel made a microcode update, microcode update br brought another problems. So a workaround uh, in GDPC has been made. Uh, and as a consequence, a lot of distros uh, not, are not enabling the HLE for default mutexes. Still, at least for my Ubuntu case, uh, the support uh, the support for HLE is available in GDPC because it has uh, two level uh, controls. One is something like have elision, second one enable elision by default. Uh, so in, if you want to switch to uh, to uh, aligning mutexes, most likely you would like to preserve the abstraction uh, layer we have at the moment and not switch to STD mutexes. Right, but if we if we convert the code to use like a Ceph mutex, then we can alias that to whichever. As far as I know, on my platform, STD mutexes are not a lighting clock. Yeah, but we could we could have all of our code use Ceph mutex, and yeah. then if we have our uh, better implementation, as long as the interface works, right? Yep, that's the reason why we could, why we, what we would need to uh, preserve. Now, the, the, in best case scenario, compile time uh, hints related to mutexes. It, it, is this something that you would you put in the like generic mutex implementation, or do you identify which mutexes it's actually going to work on and only try to do it for those? Do you instances? mean aligning mutexes? Yeah. Yep, uh, the, uh, the approach that seems most reasonable is, is to use, uh, to use uh, the TSX only for those logs that are yeah. not constantly con colliding uh, in, uh, in the matter of, uh, of memory writes. Right, yeah. Right. Moreover, uh, there is, uh, it's, it's really funny, uh, Intel in the official optimization reference manual, they are recommending putting uh, Low, additional loads and conditional jumps just to avoid store to the same location, to the same cache line. It's so funny. Weird. So, yep. So I'm a little... I, very prepared, Let me. I'm, I'm 
I'm a little concerned that this is not going to be very easy to um, to kind of test and and really. That's like... true, Mark. You are entirely <laughs> right. Uh, we in, in Inserta Lab we have. I'm not able to work uh, on the patch set uh, using uh, my Inserta node. I have to uh, use my uh, Ubuntu laptop with Skylake on board. Moreover, the complexity there is uh, simply crazy. That's the way I would prefer to not to have to, instead of trying to optimize the contention, I would like to, uh, I would prefer to have no contention at all. I mean uh, shared zero pattern. I mean C star. Yeah, I, it's I mean it's just interesting, right? But it's this is this is the kind of thing that we we sometimes do that um, kind of leaves us in weird states that we don't really understand and yeah. and users might yeah i i, I really it, it scares me a little. Yeah. i think i think we should focus on just getting the our mutex usage cleaned up so that it's using all the right um patterns whatever um so that we can alias either to standard mutex or our debugging mutex because that's going to be a big enough win yeah and uh, the uh, at the moment, our uh, mutex implementation does uh, it does a lot of unnecessary things. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, yep. it takes uh, it usually takes uh, two cache lines. Uh, it acts it uh, it may it makes uh, completely unnecessary writes, and uh, moreover, it makes uh, a lot of uh, conditional branching that is tied very 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 together, uh, which means which could which could affect branch prediction. It's the known pattern uh, to avoid. I mean, having uh, dozens of, uh, of jumps on the conditional jumps on the same uh, on the same fetch uh, on the same block, memory block that the fetcher mm -hmm. is working on. I mean, on the same, so same 16 bits bytes. It seems like that um, just being able to at compile time switch between the standard one and our debugging one will like yep. eliminate Moving all, the, all I, of that. I and then maybe we can optimize the debugging one too. Um, but um, that, that probably matters less. Yep, so that's could be the, that's, that. that will be the way I think. I have yeah. a, a okay. branch uh, that, and it turned out that all the, com, the, the options we are passing to uh, mutex constructor are solely compile time. Yep. So the, my, my branch is not it's mostly on the HLE. It's uh, it it avoids uh, to, it. The goal is to avoid as much as much modifications as possible, uh, but it may it means it translates into staying with the big M mutex uh, in most cases. Uh, it's not elegant. Uh, it's not elegant. I, I'm afraid. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. That's probably enough about mutexes. Uh, C star updates. If you actually here, yeah, keep this here. What do we want to say? Mail to, to build up the uh, test for interoperability, but the the, the async or or single single messenger is now able to establish a connection to the other one, but uh, it can cannot send the the ping M ping message to C star backend so far. I'm still looking at it. And the test is uh, has been pushed to the test branch. That's all I have. Okay. <clears throat> also, um, I guess what I wanted to bring up from this uh, was a uh, discussion about the um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> ah, excuse me. The um, organization of um, multiple OSTs and um, cores and messengers and um, object stores again. So we discussed this a bit in the past, but I think there was never really came to any conclusions yet. And um, the messenger part, at least, is starting to become more relevant. Uh, So it seems like it's clear, at least, that we do want to get to the point where we have one process um, that's taking over the network and 
serving everything. I think it's less clear exactly how we want to divide up the uh, cores among logical OSDs and the data structures within uh, the ad process, whether they could be um, actually multiple logical OSD structures and multiple messengers, or uh, if we wanted to do more of one shared structure for everything. Yeah. So my, my thing there was <clears throat> that we might want to have like, um, for mo in most cases, we're going to have more cores than um, than disks, right? Uh, uh, maybe. At least one <laughs> core per disk. At least, yeah, yeah. I, I think it depends on how um, how busy the box is going to be. Yeah. How fast the flash is, yeah. I mean, in the, the 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 grand scheme of you know all kinds of different deployments, we have both, right? We're going to have people that have these giant like 72 disk boxes that probably don't even have one core per disk, and then mm -hmm. other people that have flash that have like you know crazy huge core count CPUs and maybe only have like 10 flash disks in their box or 10 NVMe drives or something. <clears throat> So for the <clears throat> humongous numbers of disk case relative to CPU, you're, they're not going to be SSDs because they wouldn't be able to drive those SSDs, right? Well, I mean, it, I don't know. Did, it might be for did, density, right? It might be lots of yeah. flash. They might have, yeah, right. They might not be optimizing what? performance. Right. So in that case, maybe the performance isn't as important there. Um, Wasn't... Wasn't there a vendor at one point that was doing that? They were kind of like shoving a box full of like cheap, big flash disks. SanDisk, although they had, there was a weird architecture yeah. for other reasons, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else is planning on that kind of a model, but. <clears throat> I mean, okay. I'm sure there will be cheap low density, sure. or sorry, high density, low performance flash out there, right? Sure. Yeah. So okay, regardless of that, um, I guess that doesn't really affect what I was going to think about it anyway that much. Um, which is, uh, so if we did did have um, separate, essentially OSD, um, OSD separated into different cores or different subsets of cores, um, such that we could preserve like new locality within one OSD, hopefully, and have maybe perhaps one core per OSD so using use it as the messenger core uh, for that OSD. Or some mm -hmm. subset, if there's more cores or, or fewer cores per per disk. Um, it it kind of seems likely that there's going to be a crossbar at the messenger point because. Well, so I have... think we might, might be able to avoid that though with the protocol change, right? If we have if we're having logical OSDs that are having separate messengers listening on separate interface um, connections. I guess you if they're at their own. I mean, yeah, but that's the protocol change doesn't impact this at all. Then it's literally setting up a different messenger on different, or at least setting up different yeah. like ports. So right. the client who wants to talk to that box has a connection to every core in that box. Which, yeah, I think. Which is equivalent to how we're doing OSDs today with multiple yeah, processes. Yeah. Right. 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 So I think it's actually the other way around. It's where we want to. Um, so it, it seems like if we have multiple hardware, so I'm assuming we're talking about DPDK here, um, if we have sure. separate VIF, I think that's what you call it, the virtual network function, DNFs, whatever, mm -hmm. um, for each OSD, then you could have them on different cores. Um, I'm not actually sure if that's, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> I don't know if that's how these things are actually set up though. But if we're taking over the whole NIC, then you're, we're probably, it's more likely I think that we're gonna have the NIC with DBDK in user space and then multiple OSDs sharing it. And in that case, um, they're probably all gonna be shuffling to the same core, would be my guess. Well, that's the part that I'm unclear on with DBDK in particular, but uh, I guess that's when we need to talk to DBDK, to yeah. DBDK folks next, about uh, next week. It's it's kind of a 
question of like where where ultimately the the layer at which you're transferring data to other cores, right? And and what happens locally on the core and what happens distributed, you know, what happens at the DBTK level versus what happens at like the messenger level and yeah. I, I don't know if do we have a clear understanding yet of kind of what what yeah. I mean it, it it kind of feels like the um the messenger interface at the point at which we give a message to the messenger or we get a message from the messenger, like that's an easy place for that transition to happen. Yeah. So I'm kind of assuming that adding that hopping cores or not hopping cores there is sort of the easy part. Um, it makes me wonder though if if actually if the if the sort of looming <laughs> collision that we should be worried about is the um, messenger two refactor where yes, we have this the protocol thing change that's going to throw all the async messenger stuff up in the air and the C star refactor of async messenger or version port of it or whatever. Um, Cause we probably want both of those things. Right. Yeah. And I'm kind of guessing that the C star is going to be a port. It's going to be like copy the directory and then like change it. I don't know that it's, it's not going to live in the same tree, whatever, right? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's the big question. So wait, Kifu, the, when you're, what you're working on right now is a implementation of a messenger written in C star that actually interoperates with async messenger and simple messenger. Do I understand that right? Yes, more sure. like the the single messenger. Okay, but it but it actually it actually implements the the Ceph protocol, like messenger one. Yes. And it's like a it's a fresh implementation. Mm, yes, uh, it's it's basically, basically modeled after the, the single messenger. I see. Okay. Okay, I haven't seen this yet. So Is is this what Casey we talk, started targeting the messenger two? Do it again. Is this the one that Casey <clears throat> started a long time ago? Is that what this is based on, or is it something that you started? Where did this come no, from? No, it's based on Casey's work. Okay. I guess I haven't I haven't actually looked at this code yet. Um. Yeah, I'm wondering if we should target messenger <laughs> two for this. Um. But messenger two is still a little bit up in the air. Yeah, I, think it's I, was, I will finalize the, the, the design of a messenger tool so, so we can aiming targeting it instead. If that's true. If we have if if the end point is that we have a C star messenger that implements messenger two only and async messenger does both messenger one and messenger two, and simple messenger only implements messenger one. I think that's probably a, a fine endpoint because most of the world will be on async messenger as they make the transition. And then once they do make the transition to messenger two for their whole cluster, then they can start using the C star one. Um, I guess that won't actually work because we still need to support messenger one for clients. Yeah. So we probably have to do both. I take it back. Um, and we'll need both in async messenger regardless. I think just so we can get all the new protocol features. Can can we reuse the uh, existing work in messenger one? Let's say uh, C stars messenger one to when we are moving to messenger two, or we are we will likely start from scratch. Hopefully, it's not that significant a rewrite, but um, I don't know. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> I think that the part that's fuzzy is how the how we're going to internally structure the code when we have um, multiple multiple OSDs sharing the same messenger um, or the same port. Are they going to have different messenger impl impl implementations that have some like backend thing that they both share, or are they re literally going to point to the same messenger, or or what? I'm not really sure exactly how that's going to how it's going to work. Sage for for Messenger one, could we just do something really like low performance? You know, it doesn't it. We don't really worry about designing it real well, but just kind of have it wrapped off in a quarter, 
that we can have stuff just I mean, for compatibility with you know client one, clients one we, version we can, one. But I have a, I imagine that those clients are going to be messenger one for a long time. Okay. So. Um, so yeah, we don't want to kill all our kernel client users. Like. Sure. I don't, I don't think it's going to be that. It's not going to be slower. It's just going to be annoying having two versions of it. Yeah. It's going to be twice as much code. <laughs> not, not, yeah. Hopefully not quite twice as much, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this would be a good thing to try to pin down. Ricardo, I think, is going to be in fishing next week. So, um, yeah, there's still some uh, loose ends on the Messenger 2 stuff. But I think we should prioritize that early in the Mimic cycle, not Mimic, Nautilus cycle, mm -hmm. to get that sorted out, because it's going to otherwise keep biting us in the butt. Yeah, and for both uh, Messenger 2 and C Star, we probably want to start looking at um, logical OSUs within one process soon as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think we got a lot of the way there with the, the stuff, separating the stuff context. Like we're not using G stuff context in most of the OSD now. Right, there's no um, more globals for the most part. So we're not. We're not that far away, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's likely more a matter of like, getting all the startup scripts and everything else to work in that kind of configuration and figure out how that. Yeah, figuring out how that's going to work. Right. Now the install bits too. I guess if that, well, <clears throat> I guess that might not be as affected as much. Uh, yeah. It's are different. So. Yep. Hmm. I guess the first, the first simple step there is just to have them all have independent everything except for the messenger, I guess, or even independent messengers too. But. Mm -hmm. Basically the same as uh, the process model today, but in one, in one process instead of multiple. Yeah, it, it, there like there are a bunch of different ways we could go to. It could be that when you run Ceph OSD, you like on the command line, you tell it all the OSDs it's going to be, and it just does it all. Or it could be that um, you have like a an OSD runner process that you start, and then you like tell it, you know, start up, instantiate OSD zero, and it like does it instantiates OSD one and it like shuts it down. So you have OSDs coming and going within the same process. And then Ceph OSD might actually just be a thing that communicates to the, the background process to like instantiate the OSD that you asked about. Um, yeah, that might be more transparent. Uh, well, I, yeah, it's all, but then it's like, like if you, do you have a, if you have a system D unit file for like each OSD, do they, do they sit there and just, talk to the shared process. I don't know. Who knows? There are like 10 different ways you could do it. Um, probably the big question is whether we want OSTs to come and go within the same process or whether you just like shut the whole thing down and start up again with a different set. When you say OSTs come and go within a process, like, okay, so what, what happens in the case of a disk failure? What, what does that mean for... A well, single process to, with multiple today, OSDs. today when there's a disk failure, we just assert out on EIO, and so mm -hmm. all of them will crash together. Um, but it could do something else, like it could say, "I got an EIO," and it could like do an orderly shutdown of one of those OSDs, and it goes away, and then you swap out the device, yep. and then you reinstantiate it. And so we could eventually get to the point where you have the process running multiple OSDs, and like hardware fails and gets replaced, and the other OSDs stay running. Yep. But, there are like 10 other things that have to happen to get, at least 10 other things that have to happen to get there. I guess it's probably a good place to aim, but it might be that for the initial thing, we just start them all up at once, let them all die and live and die together. And then we get to the, 
fanciness over time. Yeah, it's um, a pretty big gun. Um, kind of regression and, and, and usability to for administrators to have to restart the whole host at once all the time. Yeah. So I might want to tackle that earlier. Yeah, it looks, yeah, it'd be pretty different. Like trying to make that transition as um, famous as possible. Be good. Um, but the, yeah, I think the first part I'm worried about is just how, um, how to, how those OSDs will have their messenger facing interfaces constructed right. when they're eventually sharing the same mm -hmm. backend. Um, I think mostly the only thing that's sort of like per entity state that's tied to the messenger is the my adder stuff. Um, and it might be that we don't use that that much. And so maybe we sort of construct a new thing or just pull that out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. It's going to require some careful thinking that we haven't done yet. Yeah. Um, and there are like, there are a bunch of other little things too, like um, having multiple addresses for the same endpoint. So you could have like an IPv4 and an IPv6 address and you would just bind to two ports and you could connect to either one of those. Um, that's a less ambitious piece that would still be useful. That might get us part of the way there. And um, there's one other one. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's it. And then of course, Messenger 2. Um, yeah. What um what is like uh, the Skyla DB kind of architecture look like in regards to DBDK and all of this? Do they have anything that they've worked through that didn't work well or did work well or? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. That's a good question. Don't know. Well, so stepping back a minute, it, a, a useful midpoint is um, we could get multiple, we could use DPDK to grab the entire NIC and have multiple OSDs in the same process, but they would still be running independent messengers on different ports. Right. Still using messenger v1. And that still captures like most of our goals, right? <laughs> the performance yeah. related ones, it does not the messenger two ones. So mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're, we're not strictly blocked by right. the messenger two stuff. So that's good. And it does mean we can get past the, um, the multiple OSDs in one process hurdle also without worrying about the messenger stuff being a blocking piece. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a, Step it's related, but make. not, um, yeah, but it's been a problem. Yep. Okay. And presumably there's no problem with binding to multiple addresses <laughs> um, and so on in the same process when you're and you own the whole NIC. Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah, the question my mind is more is uh, we've got to figure out whether we can um, set, use multiple cores to process the, those separate addresses or if we, they all have to be funneled through right. one. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. So okay. it sounded like what that was what Avi was saying when we talked to him, um, that it was, it was possible to do that, but uh, with the VPP stuff, that's maybe not the case, so. Yeah, so, I'm... Yeah, I'm shouldn't be, I don't think, possible because you just, like, you get interrupts on CPUs or maybe they do polling, but, like, so maybe they can poll, like, pre-register or, or, like, DMA memory that the NIC has been writing to directly and they just skip over stuff that isn't theirs, but they're still going to have to see it on some level, at least. Yeah, um, my, my guess is that one core is the one. You dedicate one of those cores to be the one that's pulling the network. 
And then it. Well, I hope it's not just one because I'm pretty sure one core isn't good enough for 10 gigabit anymore. Or at least there was a while where it wasn't quite. Maybe. For QAT cards, uh, there are multiple uh, ring, ring buffers. Basically, they are separated. So I guess this, the same pattern could be uh, in uh, the case of the PDK. So you would have you you could have uh, mapping between a set of ba ring buffers and uh, particular CPU. Um, yeah, so yeah. I guess this could be another part where it's dependent on the specific NIC hardware. Yeah. Does provide those multiple buffers. We'll find out on Monday. Yep. I think it's a perfect, perfect discussion topic. Get some clarity there. Um, okay. Uh, I guess we should, let's talk about, um, should we talk about that Blue Star Cash stuff, Mark? Before we're sure. Out? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I've got a little wall of text there, I guess. But um, the, the gist of this is that um, I wanted to see whether or not it would work to try to do some automatic tuning of the sizes of different caches between uh, Blue Store and RocksDB. And kind of the motivation for this is there we had some evidence and concern that indexes and filters might be uh, pushed out of cache especially in like RGW cases where there's there's a lot of key value pairs uh, in the in the database and a lot of key value data per object so um, what this does is uh, th there's actually a, a separate PR for RocksDB that exposes uh, high priority pool information from the LRU cache. Uh, RocksDB does not have this capability for high priority pools with the clock cache. So that's unfortunate. Um, it, it means that right now this this only kind of works well with, with the LRU cache implementation, but um, maybe we can, we can uh, improve that. Um, having said that, so th the idea here is that we, we prioritize the indexes and filters, the high priority pool first. We try to always give that memory, and and when um, there's there's drastic changes in the usage there, say all of the indexes and filters get flushed out of cache, then we very slowly shrink that pool so that if they come back in quickly, we we don't have to like reallocate it really fast. Um, right now, this this happens every five seconds, so it's it's pretty low overhead. There's there's not not a whole lot of change. It may be that we can speed that up or that we want to slow that down, but um, but kind of the, the goal here is low impact. It's just kind of, you know, very slowly looking at kind of how to rebalance these caches. Um, currently, right now, um, kind of the next order of priority is is the Blue Store Onode cache. It's not clear that that's actually a good idea in the case of, of things like RGW. Um, it may actually be that focusing on uh, giving the low priority block cache more memory is important in that case. Uh, but part of this ties into this kind of weird behavior in RocksDB where if the, um, during compaction, if the amount of data in the low priority pool exceeds the soft cap that you set, then all of the indexes and filters get flushed out of the high priority pool. And I don't know why that is, and um, I kind of generally asked about this on the RocksDB uh, Facebook dev group and didn't get an answer back. So uh, I'm not sure people even really realize it's happening since no one had any ability to even look at what was happening in the high priority pool before. So um, there, there may be something there where we're trying to optimize around this case doesn't make sense because it's just broken behavior, but we'll find out, I guess. Um, the so, so I guess what it comes down to now is I'm I'm doing a lot of testing, trying to look at okay, what what's happening in RocksDB's cache 
when we have different workloads and what's not happening and when does it make sense to prioritize the O-Node cache and when does it make sense to prioritize RocksDB's cache and how much does like buffered reads during compaction matter for that versus unbuffered reads and there's just there's a, a lot of things to look at here but um, my hope is that we'll we'll get a pretty good coverage over kind of what the behaviors are and then have more clarity regarding kind of how to prioritize those things um, after ultimately after the O node cache and the um, the uh, uh, KV low priority KV cache then we we have data that potentially can be buffered as well for buffered reads in, in blue store so that's kind of the the last order right now of priority um, at least currently according to this thing um, so I, I have a bunch of test data, but I haven't really organized it yet. I'm still collecting more stuff. Hopefully next week I should have a, a nice set of crazy dense graphs that, that will show some of these behaviors. But um, that's basically it. <laughs> that's what I've got right now. I, anyone have any questions or comments or flames? <laughs> There's one thing that you mentioned in the past was the changing the cache behavior dynamically. And do, have you figured out whether that's going to be um, an expensive behavior for RocksDB, changing the cache size? So I have not actually tried doing something like setting it really fast and then looking at profiles. Right now, at like five seconds, it doesn't appear to be particularly much of an overhead um, at, at that that resolution, I guess. But um, but that I think at some point, once maybe the the kind of overall behavior is worked out, then we should look at okay, if we if we start doing this really often, how how bad is it? Um, yeah, I, the the truth is I'm, I'm not totally sure yet. It might even be just cache implementation dependent too. Sure. Like if sure. we the clock cache and the LRU cache may have different behaviors. So um, yeah, more more things to test. <laughs> of course. I think um, one one question I would have too is um, if if this all ends up working out okay and 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 starts make and makes sense to do then um, do we want to start looking at this for other memory like do we want to try to make this more generic than just a blue store thing but I I don't know if that's if that makes sense or not. But anything we can do to kind of reduce the number of options that users tweak, I think, would be really good. Yeah, I mean, in, in the blue store case, the cache is going to be the major user of memory like this. Um, yeah. Uh, other things would use smaller amounts and not have the same kind of um, caching behavior that would be easy to bother doing like this. I was wondering if um, I, there are a couple of other buffers that we keep in, in random places, and I'm wondering if it's possible to to kind of use some kind of heuristic to determine how much they really need. Mm -hmm. I guess where it might be interesting it would be other demons or like either on the client side caches or maybe the MDS. Maybe. Do um, Josh, do you remember? Do do people ask about that stuff very often? I mean, are people tweaking the size of those buffers or caches and on the client side? Um, on the client side, not so much. I think on the NDS, maybe more, but I'm okay. not really sure. That's basically the NDS's whole job is to cache uh, metadata. Yeah. One of the things over the years that I've noticed is that people have a habit of just like finding some random tunings that somebody's made and then you know copy and pasting them in. So they'll have like 32 you know OSD threads and you know all kinds of other stuff set like randomly in various crazy ways and it doesn't you know it doesn't really make any sense. But they just like bumped everything way up and. Right, mean, yeah. That's kind of why I want. The NDS is a little better off because it basically only has one cache, but it doesn't need to distinguish types between on. 
and it actually is set by the amount of memory it uses now, so it's a lot easier to configure than it used to be. I wouldn't worry okay. too much about it. Yeah, I don't have anything else, so that's that's it for now. Hopefully, I'll have more more data next week. All right, cool. Thanks, Mark. Well, do we have anyone else have anything else that they want to talk about this week? Just. Uh... A quick question related to our mutexes, mutex abstraction, I mean, I mean, and uh, the DPDK, sorry, and the CSTAR uh, OSD. We, are sh we have uh, mutexes in many places, including also the shared, pa uh, the shared uh, common base. And uh, what we want to do with that? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's good time uh, to uh, to s try to resolve uh, this problem as we are go as we are go as we are going to make some uh, some uh, rework of uh, of the mutexes. Yeah, so there's I guess a couple things there. One is that eventually, when everything is written in the C star framework, we won't need mutexes like like regular methods mutexes. We we'll using um, kind of C star style mutexes, which are not Doing any atomic operations, but actually just basically serving as um, booleans for locked or unlocked um, within one core. But in the meantime, where we have this hybrid, uh, some parts C star and some parts not, parts that are not uh, certainly need to keep using the existing mutexes. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately the code that runs in the C star reactor won't touch any mutexes, right? Exactly. That'd be the goal. So the things that we've converted, we should avoid any reg any regular mutexes at all, and only yeah. use the C star style ones that are restricted to one core, and, and the code that we haven't converted um, is basically across a, a barrier of message passing between from that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking uh, because uh, even uncontended mutex is uh, basically a memory barrier. You have an atomic uh, underneath, which right. means uh, synchronizing, uh, which means draining uh, load and store buffers in CPU. If you have a cache uh, cache misses, they will be nicely exposed. Yeah, and then that's that kind of thing that um, is why we won't get the full performance of C star without converting everything in the stack to it. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, yeah. I, including the the common, uh, the <coughs> currently shared common part of the project. So yeah, I think like hopefully we'll limit the the bits that of common code that the reactor is using, and we'll, we'll end up with parallel implementations. So like the yeah. logging, for example, there'll be a C star logger and a there's the existing text log. I see. It but scares me a little bit how how long it might take to actually see the benefits. Yeah, and it's like a virus, to be honest. <laughs> if you want the full performance, you need to pacify everything, even see even each single atomic. Yeah. It's a big project. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Including object store, including almost everything. Yeah. And the database. Uh, Skyla DB. Uh, well, do, we, yeah. do we have a plan? Do we have a plan to drop Linux and move to OSV? <laughs> <laughs> the same, the same, uh, the same authors. Sister Skyla DB, everything uh, on top of OSV. <laughs> we should just well, rewrite it. The... Qubits. Yeah. There you go. I kind of tried to look at actually the Skyla DB code to, to understand what the the database piece looks like, and it's not it's not like something we could just like grab and and you know throw into our our code. Well, they're their own custom LSM tree 
implementation. Yeah. Which is probably not what we want um, for everything. Yeah. Yep. And and this could be a reason to st to keep digging uh, the a the HLE. Uh, because in the un, because even in the contentant uh, situation, if you are lucky, there is absolutely no there is no penalty on parallelism uh, when touching uh, such mutex. And it could be a pinpoint change, but who knows? All right. Do we have anything else? Okie doke. Well, have a good week, guys. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye. See ya. See ya. Later on.